Good morning. My name is Sakina Moore, and I am the program director of the Monuments Toolkit Project. On behalf of the United States Committee of the International Council of Monuments and Sites and the Monuments Toolkit Project, I want to welcome you to our inaugural webinar, Controversial Monuments and Contested Spaces of Regional Conflict. The United States Committee of the International Council of Monuments, Monuments and Sites, or US ICOMOS for short, is headquartered in Washington, DC, which is the traditional ter territory of the Nakotchunk and the Costin and Piscataway people. It is not merely enough to do a land acknowledgement, but how can we support indigenous communities into the future? With the Monuments Toolkit, we are looking at the legacies that, that our societies uphold and making the links to social injustice, health injustice, and economic injustice that these monuments have come to symbolize. We do this by uplifting stories that were ignored and untold by inviting conversations as we get into these uncomfortable places. We will offer a toolkit for communities that are facing controversial monuments and monuments of oppression, whether it is removal, reinterpretation, and recontextualization. We invite you to visit www.usicomos.org to sign up to receive updates on the work that we're doing. Again, welcome. And I want to introduce you to William Humphrey, Program Associate for Research and Publications, who will be moderating today's webinar. Thank you. Greetings, everyone, and welcome to this webinar. My name is William Humphrey, and I'm proud to host this first installment in the Monuments Toolkit webinar series. For today's theme, we are covering contested spaces for regional conflicts. And our two guest speakers each will be discussing a different corner of the world. And they will present their perspectives on complex sites and narratives in their communities. To start, our first guest speaker will be talking about monuments in Czechoslovak public spaces. Dr. Petra Shvardova will be the first of our guests. Following her presentation, we will have Kevin Sue discuss both the rise in democracy and how that correlates to public identity and representation in Taiwan. And he will discuss also several other sites. So I hope you enjoy, enjoy the presentation. Okay. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, it's nice to uh, to join you now in this session. Uh, I'm Petra Shadlova, and I will speak today about the communist era monument in uh, Czechoslovakian uh, public space after '89, um, after the Velvet Revolution. So uh, I have a presentation that I share with you. Yeah, I hope you can see my uh, my screen. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, communist era monument after eighty nine in Czechoslovak public space. Um, firstly, I will speak about public space uh, after eighty nine or during uh, eighty nine. This is my first part. Uh, wait, I can move this. Oh. Okay, uh, so the fall of socialist dictatorships in Central Eastern Europe resulted uh, in the radical reshape reshaping, reshaping of the public space, including the shrine of communist propaganda, it means monuments, statues, and the uh, bust. The manifestation in November and December 89 significantly modified the visual images, image of Czechoslovakian streets. The suspension of Article 4 about the leading position of the Communist Party 
represented the first step to remove the symbol of the communist ideology. And the street became a symbolical embodiment of citizens' demand. Uh, from December 89, people had been, uh, had been removing uh, massively the symbols of communist uh, regime, as you can see on the, on the picture. Um, communist slogans, Red Star, Hammer and Sickle, gradually disappeared from the buildings with the other pro-communist pro slogans. For example, Czech town Olomouc uh, declared during the second week of uh, December 89, the so-called Red Week. Uh, the Red Week was a temporary uh, event when students from local university took part uh, in the removal of the most visible symbols of the communist power. The students' plan consisted of the idea to send all removed symbols by train to the small Czech, ta Czech village, it was a town, but village, called Bespravi, uh, and translate, it's uh, Unjustice, so it's a great name for this village. Uh, the racist group decided to create here an open air uh, museum of totali totalitarianism, but it's never, it, uh, it, it was never created finally, uh, unfortunately. So uh, the next step after the removal of the communist signs and slogans was to focus on the elimination of the statue and monument celebrating members of the communist regime. The most significant removal from the pedestal occurred in uh, December 89 and January 90. Uh, some uh, monuments were destroyed completely. For example, Gottwald uh, monument in Bratislava, uh, as you can see on the red, uh, uh, on the left side down. Uh, um, some of them were sold. Uh, for example, the Lenin monument in Poprad, the statue traveled uh, to the American town Seattle's on, uh, uh, so maybe you can know about this statue on the right side of my presentation. Um, and some monuments were used to create a new monument. So uh, it's a funny story also. <laughs> but in uh, generally, uh, the problematic monument or controversial monument were replaced to another place or to depository of the local museums. The massive removal of the monument and other communist signs during the next months and years symbolized the rupture with the old political regime. The empty pedestal and places gave hope for a new and happy uh, beginning. However, there is a question who decided uh, which monuments will be removed and which monuments uh, will be uh, preserved. Well, in, Czechoslovak in Czechoslovakia, each, each town created a special commission to decide about the des uh, destiny of the monument uh, on their territory. For example, in January 1990, a meeting of the Art Council of the town Bratislava in Slovakia, in the capital of Slovakia, was held to evaluate the situation of the existing monuments and uh, to decide about eventual removal of the most problematic statue. Discussions uh, remarked that Br Bratislava as the capital of Slovakia should lead the way for other cities how to deal with, the issue, with this issue. All participants rejected the destructive, uh, destructive tendencies of the statue and memorials. So it's a positive, uh, it was a positive news. Uh, in the case of uh, vandalism, which uh, happened uh, mostly every day by the red coloration at the hand or by some offensive notices, uh, the commission proposed to cover the most controversial monument by a piece of sheets or some tool to mask them. Monuments to Lenin, Gottwald, uh, statue of Milician man uh, represented the most problematic monument in Czechoslovak uh, public space. The others, for example, the memorials of World War II uh, in this area, in, I mean, in Czechoslovak territory, the mostly uh, here is a, like a memory of World War II uh, represents Soviet war mem memorials. So these monuments uh, dedicated to some historical uh, event rested untacked uh, in their original places. So uh, they were not uh, destroyed, they were not removed, they stayed uh, in their initial places. Sometimes they were covered by a message or signs uh, also. 
So uh, now I will I will pass to another to the second part of my presentation about controversial monuments uh, or controversial sim symbols. So uh, after 1989, not only a person represented the monument, but especially the specific parts and symbols became also controversial. The hammer and sickle and the red five-pointed star represented the most discussed and controversial symbol of after 89. The symbolism of these two emblems still represents the problematic part of the existence of, for example, Soviet army memorials. For people or for society, the symbols represent a memory of the Soviet Union and not memory of World War II. A uh, very common opinion of the specialists or historians, art historian, uh, historians or sociolo so sociologists is that uh, the monuments and problematic symbols should not be removed or destroyed. The society needs to explanation and examination of these signs, they say. <laughs> They suggest to keep uh, the controversial monument in, at their initial places with the placing there an additional information and inscription. Uh, unfortunately, it was a standard uh, that uh, unwanted symbols and inscription were mechanically removed from the monument after 89. Uh, attention is not always drawn to, to the contextualization of the memorial site through informative text and plaques. Right after 89, some plaques uh, from communist past uh, disappeared and uh, have been replaced by completely new ones. The reasons uh, are the same. The text with ideological concept referred too much to the former regime and therefore became very under, undesirable. But thanks to informative and commemorative plaque, the monuments become more readable. Visitors of memorial sites can therefore familiar, familiarize themselves with the, with the meaning of the memorial and the historical facts uh, of uh, this region or of this monument. However, there is still a lack of proper reflection and adaptation of the plaque to, to today's visitor and a lack of reference to the links between the past and the, and the present. Therefore, it is not appropriate to talk about rewriting history, as the, for example, Embassy of Russian Federation often talks about, but rather about, uh, about an attempt to present a, compre a comprehensive and critical side of the, of the history. However, this approach does not work for the removal of the original plaque. The original text with their updated interpreted interpretation as well as uh, the interpretation of the symbol can help to better understand some of historical events as well as the ideological connotation of the memorial erected during uh, the communism. Now, finally, uh, I pass to my third uh, part and I will speak about the Konya monument. So discussion about Marshall Konyev, uh, Marshall Konyev monument in Prague. This is, um, you can see on the photo of Marshall Konyev uh, arri arriving in Prague in May uh, 4045 during the liberation. Uh, so Marshall Konyev, the uh, Soviet Marshal took part in the liberation of Prague, uh, a part of Poland, Silesia and Saxony at the event of World War II. Uh, however, he also led the bloody suppression of the Hungary, Hungarian uprising uh, in uh, uh, 1956 and held a post in Berlin when the Berlin Wall was built in uh, 1961. In 1968, uh, um, Konev controlled also the situation during Prague Spring and helped the invasion of the Warsaw Pact troop in Czechoslovak territory. So the memory about uh, Konyev uh, are very controversial. Uh, firstly, we can see uh, we can talk about liberation, but uh, the second part also, and the and the other side, we can speak about the about the invasion uh, of uh, of the Warsaw Pact and Soviet troops in Czechoslovakian territory in 1968. So a statue of the Soviet military commander Ivan Konyev was built in Prague, Prague District uh, Six. Uh, one district of Prague, 
uh, during uh, the normalization era in uh, 1980 by two sculptures. And the statue of Marshal Konyev was situated a commemorative plaque with the text, uh, significant uh, commander marshal of the Soviet Union, Ivan Stepanovich Konyev, double hero of the Soviet Union and hero of the Czechoslovak Socialist Republic, commander of the troops uh, of the first Ukrainian front, which rescued Prague from destruction on May 9, uh, 1945. So since 1989, the monument represents a problematic heritage from communist era. In 2007, Czech uh, authorities considered to relocate it on the pretext of reconstruction work in the area. They also planned to reduce the height of the pedestal. Nothing was made finally, and uh, even uh, if the monument is not ranked as a war uh, monument and has no national or international uh, protection. Uh, the monument uh, has been often vandalized uh, in uh, 2014 uh, in the pink color, uh, pink paint, you know, as you can see on the, on the, on the photo, uh, was part over the monument of the World War II leader. In, um, in uh, 2015, the description Heil Putin uh, was painted at the pedestal. Uh, and in November 2017, uh, the monument was covered by red color with the years uh, 1968, so Hungarian, uh, Hungarian uh, surprising, 68 uh, Berlin Wall, and then 68 uh, Spr Prague Spring, uh, and uh, 2017, uh, the, the date of the, of the, of the vandalism. And then 2018, after the victory day on May 9th, the monument was covered by pink color again. So there were uh, many, many uh, vandalism and color, colorization of this monument. Uh, the Kony monument, if we speak about the statue, well, the monument uh, is owned by District Prague 6, uh, which cares and finances its maintenance and decides about eventual destruction, removal, or uh, even uh, eventual modification. In, 2000, uh, in 2015, so it's one, just one uh, year after, uh, or just a couple of months after, after the Russian aggression uh, in Ukrainian territory, uh, the district of Prague 6, six discussed uh, um, about the decision uh, to remove or to preserve uh, the monument. The final decision was to keep the monument. Uh, at the initial place with uh, additional information plaque about the historical fact, about the historical information of Konev. In November 2017, the Prague 6 uh, assembly approved the placing of a brief CV of Konev on the statue pedestal with the aim uh, to give additional historical context and illustrate the figure of the monument uh, and his historical contribution to Prague um, entirely, we thought uh, that it's, uh, it's people in the in the district uh, Prague six uh, say we thought it would be a shame not to use the statue while it is here, that it could serve as an educational tool to show what society experiences in the twentieth uh, in the twentieth century. So uh, two uh, scientific institution, the Military Historical Institute, Institute in Prague and the Institute uh, for Contem of Contemporary History of Academy of Sciences uh, of the Czech Republic provided evaluation of the original plaque and proposed a new uh, informative text. Um, a group of post-Soviet states, its ambassadors have protested uh, as, as a normal. Uh, and, um, and they protested to, to not put an uh, informative plaque at the uh, local statue of the Red Army uh, Marshal. Uh, and they, they didn't want to mean this uh, negative connotation of the, of the, of the Marshal of Konev. So they say also this uh, ambassador uh, post uh, or former Soviet states, they say, uh, we consider the deci decision by, Prague, by the Prague district leadership and attempt to belittle the significance of the monument, which is a symbol of Prague inhabitants' gratitude for the liberation of the city. Uh, so they wrote, adding uh, that the decision has a political connotation. 
Uh, however, a bronze plaque with a Czech text uh, and two smaller inscriptions in English and the Russian was installed uh, on the pedestal of the monument in uh, 1918 during the 15th anniversary of Prague Spring in 68. Uh, so it was a uh, uh, it was another they they choose a date to to um, to show this new plaque. Uh, the new plaque explained that Marshal Ivan, Ivan Stepanovich Konev commanded uh, the first Ukrainian front, whose troops were deployed for the final attack on Berlin and liberated in the northern, the, the, liberated the northern, central, and eastern Bohemia, and entered as a first in Prague on May 9, uh, 1945. In the fall of uh, 1956, uh, he controlled the suppression of the Hungarian uprising by the Soviet army and as a commander of the Soviet army group in Berlin in 1961 he was in, involved in solving the so-called Berlin crisis by building the Berlin Wall. In the summer of 1968 he personally helped with the invasion of Warsaw Pact troops in Czechoslovakia so as you can see in the photo this, this was a new plaque uh, um, situated there in 1918. The, additional, the addition of explanatory text failed to appease uh, either opponents or supporters of the statue. Uh, the city uh, finally decided uh, to remove the statue entitled from, the, from its original uh, location uh, in, the, in the praxis, uh, and it was uh, during the pandemic, uh, during, in April uh, 1990, during the pandemic situation and lockdowns uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Czech Republic. So the people couldn't move, couldn't uh, replace there and to protest or to say something. Everybody was at home and then they removed this statue uh, in the asylum. Yeah, this is, uh, this is all what I can what what I propose to you, and after I will uh, I will I will be glad for your for your question. Thank you. Yeah. Hi everyone. Uh, my name is Kevin Sue. I teach courses on design, public participation, and sustainable development at Stanford University. Uh, many thanks to Ecomos US and the Monuments Toolkit Project for hosting us, and much appreciation to William Humphrey for pulling us together, as well as to Petra Schwardova for the fascinating insights. You can already see resonances across different post-authoritarian societies. Uh, today, I'm glad to have an opportunity to share with you about Taiwan and how it has grappled with a difficult legacy. As a researcher in democracy and heritage issues, it's a fascinating case and the story is still unfolding. The democratic island of Taiwan is home to 23 million people. It has a reputation as a technological powerhouse that is exceptionally welcoming to visitors. The Economist Intelligence Unit has ranked it the freest democracy in Asia. It is fiercely committed to sustainable development and became the first country in Asia to legalize gay marriage. But the open liberal society you see today wasn't always this way. Until late in the 20th century, Taiwan was ruled by a right-wing authoritarian regime and people could be jailed for thought crimes. The turn to democracy is a tale of protest and struggle requiring many different sectors of society working together to dissent, organize, and join hands in overturning that dictatorship. But following democratization, contested legacies come with the territory. The Nationalist Party, the Guomindang in Mandarin, which is abbreviated KMT in English, uh, ruled over Taiwan for many decades, and it remains a force in politics. Political and human tragedies are a lived experience for people who are still here today, and persecutors and the persecuted coexist in the same cities. Those educated under the old system and some who benefited from it are still alive and influential. So in 2022, while there is a solid consensus around the fact that democracy is a desirable form of governance, there are still symbols and institutions that, even if transfigured in some way, give an uncomfortable echo of Taiwan's authoritarian past. A quick glimpse of Taiwan's history shows how it is complicated and plural. For millennia, indigenous communities have lived here. In the 1600s, the Dutch and Spanish attempted to establish colonies on this island they called Formosa. Han migrants from the Ming Dynasty, which ruled China, began settling the island, 
and more immigration occurred after Manchus invaded China, founding the Qing Empire. The Qing eventually incorporated the western part of Taiwan, coming into conflict with natives. Now, amid Europe's scramble for colonies in the 1800s, Imperial Japan also joined the fray. In 1895, Qing China and Meiji Japan fought a war, and Taiwan came under Japanese colonial rule. To build this model colony over the next 50 years, the Japanese implemented railroads, mining, and communications infrastructure. Now, as Taiwan developed under Japanese colonization, China itself was undergoing turbulent transitions as well, including a revolution in 1911 that overthrew the Qing emperor and founded a republic. When Japan lost World War II in all of its Pacific territories, the Republic of China, a triumphant member of the Allied powers, occupied Taiwan on behalf of the victors. The ROC was led by Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek, China's wartime leader and head of the Nationalist Party. While the troops were initially welcomed, the Nationalists were also famously corrupt, and in two short years, a once thriving Taiwanese economy was driven into the ground. Now, one February day in 1947, so um, at the end of World War II, when the Nationalists arrived, that was 1945, um, in February 1947, um, government agents violently beat a grandmother for selling cigarettes without a permit and then fired into the crowd that formed around them, killing a bystander. So nationalist troops shot many civilians the next day, February 28th, starting weeks of killings. And in numerals, that date is rendered 228. Uh, and kind of this date actually will kind of have re recurring meaning uh, in Taiwan. So a larger island-wide protest arose as people demonstrated in the streets, committees organized to write petitions of grievance. Uh, Chang quick, uh, swiftly sent in soldiers from China to put down the protests, and there are estimates that some 10,000 to 30,000 civilians were killed. And this massacre left a huge scar on the psyche of Taiwan's people. Um, in his, innocent civilians died, and a reformist generation of civic leaders was liquidated. And while many families were touched by these horrendous events, no one could talk about it. In 1949, uh, Chang and the nationalists were losing a civil war against the communists in China, and they fled to Taiwan with a flood of about 1.2 million refugees. And they and their descendants make up about 15% of Taiwan's population today. Uh, in 1949, Chiang uh, Kai-shek declared martial law, and with this came the White Terror. Uh, Zhang ruled with an iron fist, suspected communist sympathizers were rounded up and executed, dissidents, labor organizers, democratic activists, anyone who challenged his rule could be arrested, tortured, and disappeared. Books and newspapers were censored, and discussion of events like the 228 massacre was strictly forbidden. Martial law stretched from 1949 to 1987, one of the longest periods of martial law in the world. An estimated 140,000 people were imprisoned or tried by military courts, and anywhere from three to 8,000 were executed. And even overseas dissidents could be assassinated, generating fear at home and abroad. And a cult of personality developed. Um, while the secret police operated with impunity, Zhang's visage was placed in many public places, military bases, educational institutions, city parks, government offices. Now, after Jiang's death in 1975, a 25-hectare site of prime land in the capital, Taipei, originally planned as an economic development zone, was converted to a memorial site. And so you can see here um, that memorial hall. And the area also has Chinese-style gardens, a plaza flanked by a national concert hall, a national theater, and a traditional Chinese gate. And so these are some of the features in that area. And here's the view uh, from the Memorial Hall itself, looking down into this plaza uh, with some other amenities. A huge bronze statue of Zhang was seated within the hall, attended to by an honor guard. And this all is within a few blocks of the presidential office, the legislature, and other important government buildings. So while Zhang's son continued to rule for more than a decade, uh, democracy was stirring in Taiwan. And it joined other nations like Portugal, Greece, and Spain in what we call the third wave of democratization. Opposition parties were legalized and martial law finally ended in 1987. And in 1990, the Wild Lily student movement took place on this very plaza in front of the Zhang Kai-shek Memorial Hall 
calling for democratic reforms, which spurred even greater opening. And since then, Taiwan has seen multi-party legislative and presidential elections resulting in peaceful transfers of power between the KMT and the opposition, the major opposition, the Democratic Progressive Party. And this opening then meant that commemoration of a very different sort could take place, not only of the strongman who had ruled Taiwan, but of the everyday people who had lived and died under him. So after decades of silence, society could finally talk about events like the 228 massacre and the white terror. People shared stories, photographs, records of family members who had been killed. Uh, in 1995, President Li Zhenhui issued a formal apology for 228. A memorial, which you see on the right, was erected and museums were set up to remember the regime's victims. And inside this 228 museum, you can see photos, clothing, objects that gave testimony to the real lives that were snuffed out in the killings of 1947. Furthermore, the military tribunal that sentenced so many during the white terror for opposing the government has now been converted to a national human rights museum. And it aims to bring to light the enormous violations that occurred under Zhang's rule and educate people so such atrocities might never happen again. And this monument at the museum shows the names of each prisoner sentenced by the tribunal and the years they were locked away. And if a year appears in red, that person was executed. Now, these sites of conscience are places where people can learn about the tragedies of the past and contemplate the change that has occurred in Taiwan over the last few decades, hopefully strengthening their commitment to democracy. But what about Chiang Kai-shek, the man who sat atop this authoritarian edifice, controlling the military, the police, and the judiciary? Today, Chiang's legacy in Taiwan is mixed. The propaganda machine portrayed him as a steely ruler and a sunny grandfather. He is known for protecting Taiwan against communist invasion and initiating development projects. Um, although Taiwan's later economic miracle did really take place largely under his son. But he has his adherents. However, to the survivors, to the families of victims and to those who lived in fear of the secret police, they consider him a dictator who persecuted civilians and quashed democracy. So these questions keep arising. Does Zhang deserve a place of honor? Should his images and statues adorn public buildings? And what does it say about us as a society if this historical figure stands in places of public veneration? So in the West, particularly the United States and the UK, for example, uh, we've kept controversial statues in public until public sentiment explodes, as we've seen in recent years. Uh, in Taiwan, by contrast, since the 2000s, uh, public institutions have been begun addressing this challenge in a more proactive way, albeit in fits and starts, and it hasn't been easy. Um, it's been noted that it's increasingly dissonant to encounter the statue of a man who stood in opposition to the democratic values of the country today. But at the same time, if you proposed melting all of these statues down, you would risk triggering backlash from Zhang's supporter, many of whom are older persons who grew up in the authoritarian era when they were taught to support him, and some of whom still admire him. So one approach is to actually diffuse the tension by relocating the statues. Some institutions have been quietly shifting the statues out to a park near its Suhu Mausoleum, where Zhang's sarcophagus lies. Instead of dismantling the statues, the question of keeping or destroying them is sidestepped for another day. They're placed in a location that is interpreted as sufficiently respectful, but also out of everyday review, uh, out of everyday view to remove it from veneration or retriggering public trauma and they can remain there as his legacy is litigated. And this critical mass of the sites does provide some cover as well. So here are a few more photos. And at this time, there are about 200 statues out there out of thousands that are on the island. Another approach is to address the statues with humor. And this particular figure is located at the most renowned boys high school in Taiwan, where it has become an annual tradition to dress the statue in creative outfits. And they have removed its power through rituals of irreverence. But the big sticking point still remains that Memorial Hall in downtown Taipei. Now in 2007, when the Democratic Progressive Party, right, remember the longtime Democratic opposition was in power, um, the memorial was renamed from the Chiang Kai-shek Memorial Hall to Democracy Memorial Hall. And the ceremonial archway that once bore the phrase, da zhong zhi zhen, which included two characters of Zhang's honorific name. So some claimed that that 
placard on the gate was also memorializing him. This was refashioned as Ziyou Guangchang or Liberty Square. Now the changes sparked fierce partisan criticism, however, between supporters of Zhang who believed um, this was erasing history and between supporters who believe of this action, who believed this was a sign of democratic progress. At the next election, which was won back by the nationalists or the KMT, the name of the hall was switched again back to Jiang Kai-shek Memorial, although Liberty Square has remained. And the Memorial Hall has national landmark status and the entire garden complex around it also has, culturally, has cultural protections. And so for now, elderly residents of Taipei stroll the gardens and practice Tai Chi. Um, the complex offers a civic hub with theater and symphony performances and the plaza hosts dance rehearsals like the one you see here, as well as tour groups, wedding photos, and of course, political protests. If you click on a Google map and zoom over Taipei, the Jiang Kai-shek Memorial Hall simply automatically leaps up as a huge landmark. Uh, so it's still there and inside the museum, Contained within is really a hagiography to the leader, extolling his virtues and celebrating his life's milestones. So it doesn't, it's not really a historically balanced treatment. Now in 2018, a transitional justice commission was formed to open up government archives and reveal wrongdoings of the past, clear the names of those unjustly prosecuted, investigate ill-gotten assets of the old regime and address authoritarian symbols. As a commission has made recommendations such as last year, um, or such as previously discontinuing Zhang's honor guard, renaming streets and sites, or further removing statues. But they only have the power to recommend, and they're leaving the actual implementation to other agencies. And um, they've also hosted public engagement workshops on what to do about the Zhang Kai-shek Memorial Hall and statue, and finally recommended last year that the statue be removed and the hall be repurposed. But again, it could only make a recommendation and action would trigger emotions from both victims and apologists. So the government has found it not quite prudent to wade into these waters yet, although sometimes protesters will deface the statue to make a political point. Now, instead of debating the binary choice of keeping or demolishing, another interesting alternative approach has surfaced. So three professional societies, the Society of Modern Architecture, Urban Design, and Landscape Architecture have come together, and something that's already unprecedented. And on July 1st of this year, they will launch an open competition seeking entries for what to do with the memorial site. They hope to have a plan ready by May 2023, at which time the current president will still have a year left in her term and action can be taken. Now, these images are from a class recently taught at University of Washington taught by a Taiwanese American landscape architect who's also an advisor to the competition, Professor Jeff Ho. And even this studio exercise shows that there are a lot of ideas waiting to be surfaced. And that requires dialogue about what could be. So in the end, uh, perhaps it's not only about one man or one historical figure as pervasive as he was in Taiwan's past. The question is not between maintaining the status quo or demolishing it, if we look toward a more pluralistic vision for the future, we see a Taiwan that is diverse, inclusive, and democratic. And that means new forms, different methods, creative strategies are possible. It's not easy, but as it continues to deepen its democracy, the hope is that Taiwanese society will find or fashion the tools and the social processes that allow it to navigate this challenge and secure important values for future generations. Thank you. Thank you both for your presentations. Uh, I've really appreciated seeing the, seeing the presentations from a non-surface level point of view. Um, from, for me specifically, I could only really find this information if it was circulated by the media or if I happened to see any headlines or report references. So I think it's good to have this opportunity to view it from other perspectives and to assess the knowledge of those that are much more related or working with these case studies. Thank you both for that. Uh, if you're just joining us or if you came in late, I would like to again reintroduce our guest speakers. And I would also like to open up the Q&A portion of the meeting. So if there's anything you would like to ask them, 
please refer to the Zoom Q&A feature and I will review them and offer them to our guest speakers if selected. Now, Zvardova Petra is a postdoctoral fellow at the Institute of Contemporary History of the Czech Academy of Sciences and partially works at the Institute of History, Slovak Academy of Sciences. One of her current projects is the iconoclasm in the Czechoslovak public space after 1989, the heritage of socialism and historical perspective, which focuses on the communist era monuments in Czechoslovakia after the Velvet Revolution. Dr. Svardova had previously finished her thesis under uh, the joint PhD program of the Histi Institute of History and Slovak Academy of Sciences and INALCO Paris, the University of Languages and Civilizations. I wanna thank you for having joined us for our presentation, Dr. Petra. And I would like to bring up a few questions from what you've shown us. Uh, the first I would like to ask is for the town commissions that you mentioned, uh, is there a list or a database available for the public to view the monuments that were selected by the town as the most problematic or the most controversial? Uh, so there is no list, of course. It was a chaos during the 89. So, uh... We, we have uh, some uh, documents from archives, but normally you have to collect all and to make your list. Uh, uh, it's, it's my work um, now, for, uh, of, uh, for example, did I, did I prepare a list of the monuments that uh, were removed or uh, relocated or destroyed from the public space uh, after 89? And um, my attention is uh, on the most controversial monument. And uh, that mean a monument of the, the statue of the Gottwald, who was first uh, Czechoslovakian president uh, of a communist uh, regime. Uh, after it was a statue of Lenin, Lenin, uh, everybody knows Lenin. And uh, uh, there were also militia men. It's a man of the, with the military uh, aspect with all clothes and this. Uh, and uh, these monuments were built after 68, after the normalization era in uh, Czechoslovakia. So it's very important to say that all monuments destroyed, really destroyed, because the most of them were replaced. Uh, but uh, these uh, were re destroyed completely. It was uh, uh, certainly the monument uh, created or um, built after 68, so during the normalization era. So uh, it, it says that the memory of the people uh, still works. And uh, they, so in 19 or in the 89, they, they, um, they, they have a memory of, of this time and they, want, they didn't want to see this monument any, any time. So uh, the most part of the monument destroyed uh, in 89 or 90s, it was this part of monument built after 68, after the Prague Springs, after the invasion of Soviet troops in 68. Uh, it's, a into, uh, it's very, we can compare with the same situation now in Ukraine. So uh, you have a very negative connotation of uh, Russian and Soviet, uh, Soviet Union uh, in 89. But what it's uh, what is really um, interesting and um, it's, it's, uh, it's about the Marshal Konev also that the uh, all monuments um, dedicated to the World War II or some historical aspect they they were presented uh, they were preserved uh, uh, at the public space so uh, it's a case of a Konev monument in uh, 19 that uh, I had documented that they had to remove the Konev monument for example but finally they decided to to keep it uh, on the initial place because they said it's a, it's a part of our history. So nobody in this time say the World War II or the liberation of uh, Czechoslovakia, um, it's a false or it's, a, it's, it's not our history. Uh, it, the discussion now, it's different 
because mm -hmm. some new uh, monument uh, also um, reappeared. And also we, we can speak uh, in liberty, if you, if you want, we can speak uh, uh, of uh, everything and uh, everybody start to study of the World War II. So we can see that uh, the war of the liberation of Czechoslovakia was also, um, it was also a part of a global uh, situation uh, after World War II, uh, some, some aspect that the American uh, couldn't arrive to the Prague because they say the Soviets need to arrive first, for example. So uh, it was a decision of, uh, uh, of the world uh, places that, uh, for example, Czechoslovakia will be, be, be a part of influence of the Soviet Union after 1948. Uh, all right, that? thank you so much. I would also, since we're a little low on time, I would also like to reintroduce Kevin Su, who has worked on sustainable development, climate resilience, heritage, converse, heritage conservation on both sides of the Pacific, including areas such as the San Francisco Bay Area, Shanghai, Beijing, Hong Kong, and Singapore. Kevin's current research focuses on strategies for incorporating equity and inclusion into infrastructure planning. As a lecturer at Stanford University, Hasso Plattner Institute of Design, he teaches courses on civic design, public participation, and placemaking. Uh, I was very interested, Kevin, to see in your presentation that the museums had picked up um, some of the Chiang Kai-shek statues and that they've been able to compile a lot of the records and reports. Um, I wanted to briefly ask you, in the relocation of these statues, are they still managed by the government or is this now a more private venture? Um, yeah, I think that's a great question. And I think it also dovetails with one of the questions from the audience, which was asking, is there an official public policy process um, for what to do about controversial monuments? So I'll kind of meld those two questions together. Um, I think in some sense, there are, they are still formulating in Taiwan what to do, and it's not necessarily a regular process. It's often dependent on the ministry or the local government body that controls the site where it's located. Um, but those questions are arising. And one really useful step was that formation of the Transitional Justice Commission in 2018, um, and it concluded its work this year. And one of the things they did was to help organize workshops, um, to scope things out, kind of get conversations started. Um, and that also provides, I think, more hope um, that the younger generation um, coming together with older folks are learning things, not just from the textbooks, but have more ways of discussing these ideas. And I think museums and NGOs too are also initiating these dialogues. I think that's spurring um, how people think about how we um, treat these particular situations. And so even if it's not um, yet a fully formalized process, right? These, there are recommendations coming out and it's both um, you know, semi-public and um, um, kind of nonprofit institutions that are also helping drive the conversation in, in addition to the uh, public government agencies that can actually control sites or statues. Thank you, Kevin. And now I would like to ask both you and Dr. Shvardova, um, one of the questions submitted by Serena, she wants to ask, how can we reframe statues, park names, or et cetera, as public art rather than history interpretation so that we can move away from a narrative of rewriting history. And she feels that history itself is not always being rewritten. And sometimes it is a newer generation that views the cultural landscape and believes that today it no longer reflects their community or themselves. Uh, I would like to hear both of your thoughts on that perspective. Uh, uh my perspective um yes of course i'm i'm totally agree that we are not talking about rewriting history it's a, um it's again and uh, still uh, a new look uh, at the public monuments 
it's our society who looks uh, at the monuments. The monument, it's a public, uh, it's a public material. It's a, it's, a, it's a part of the public space. So it's mean it's for a public. So it's for us. So it's mean uh, for a for a new for this contemporary society. So that means uh, that our values or our look at this monument uh, has to be uh, uh, appropriate. Uh, uh, or the statue has to uh, appropriate it to our values and, uh, and the views. So uh, it's a normal that we, uh, that we add this uh, information, addition information of the monument, or we try to explain that uh, at the some times or some uh, historical periods, the, the monuments uh, were, were used for propaganda, for example, yeah, that uh, they, they were not real historical um, historical presentation of the real history. That means that they will use for something, for some tool, for some yeah propaganda. Uh, so for me, yeah, we have to change always the the view uh, of this monument. It's normal, I think. But remove the monument. It's uh, for example for me, it's not uh, uh, it's not good. Uh, um, the good, good moments that we can, what we can do with uh, with the controversial monuments. That, that, that there were a question about the U U.S. What did happen in the U.S. Um, in the last year or two eight, uh, two years? Uh, uh, we can we can to speak after. So I uh, I will pass to Kevin to speak about more. Uh, sure, happy to chime in. Uh, so yes, I think for the statue, um, it is history. Um, it is also art. Um, it's also an opportunity and a tool for education. Um, and I think it reflects not just about the statue itself, but also more broadly, like what do people use the site surrounding it for? And also kind of what do you want this whole package to represent in the future? And I think that adding in some of these like design possibilities for uh, changing the area, you know, evolving the site um, and kind of bringing in new compatible uses. And it's kind of probably um, lexicon more from the urban planning dialogue, but you can still retain a sense of history, but add nuance, depth and interpretation um, with some of these landscape and urban design changes as well. And it's a discussion for society to have. Um, and I think these civic dialogues plus kind of design um, exercises give us more possibilities. And so even if the meaning can change. Um, I, I know sometimes people worry, um, oh, are we rewriting history um, or are you getting rid of history? But um, whatever happens with the site, um, and even if meanings change, um, that can actually attract uh, more positive attention um, because the site itself becomes more welcoming and inclusive to more people. Um, and also because it now is an exemplar of something you actually believe in. And in Taiwan's case, um, it's a way for it to continue to hold up the torch for democratic values um, for Asia and for the rest of the world too. Thank you both for your responses. I have another interesting question from Justin G. Moore. I will hit this up. So Justin mentioned that he wanted to ask if we've seen, either of you have seen the use of technology or digital augmented reality or other multimedia projects that were used for any of these commemorative sites. And he wants to know if any of these incorporations have been sustainable or broadly impactful with the public. Uh in Czech, in Czech and Slovak Republic now, uh, there is no uh, such uh, pedagogical tools or digital tools to interpret it, uh, the monuments, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, I hope that will be a plan for the future. Uh, it's a chance to, to, to do something with the, with the monuments, to, to give them the chance to, to speak, because the monuments, they are uh, uh, muted. And uh, like this, you can, you can uh, give them a, a voice. But I know about some exhibition or some some uh, project in England, for example, that uh, uh, the statue or some famous statue in the public space, uh, they are speaking something. The, the, 
somebody is crossing uh, uh, around and the, 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 the monument start to speak. So it's, uh, it's a funny in one part, but it's also that uh, there is uh, information about uh, who is it, because normally you, you pass by a, a monument and you don't uh, even have a look, you, you, you never mentioned that it's something there. If you cross, I don't know, many times uh, after you, you, are, you have not that attention, attention of this monument. So uh, it's, it's nice to see that there is some project that uh, they introduce uh, the, the voices for the statue. Yeah. I hope uh, this is a future plan here also. I, um, it will be nice. Yeah, for the Taiwanese perspective, um, like the Taiwanese media um, has, you know, released um, different types of um, digital products like videos, um, kind of interactive things. Uh, the Taiwanese media is just very good at producing that kind of digital content. Um, and then museums themselves actually, um, oh, sorry. And then uh, museums themselves do incorporate um, some digital dimensions to um, the exhibits when you do visit. Um, and then for the media stuff, if you wanna see an example like Taiwan Plus, that website actually has some materials that have been translated or created in English that you can access. Although there's much more obviously in Mandarin, um, but there are some kind of English examples there. Um, and then another thing that's happened is that um, by making kind of more archives, more records um, digital, um, that has increased accessibility for the public to actually like go and understand um, what was happening in this earlier era. Um, but I would say that there's, it doesn't replace the power of a site, right? To actually visit um, and to know that this is where some of these things happen. This is where some people were imprisoned or sentenced to death. Um, that doesn't change. And so kind of you have both the use of digital tools, but also um, knowing that, you know, for people to encounter things in real life, there's still power there. Yes, I, I agree. I've definitely seen a greater pull in a lot of these facilities or the organizations that manage these sites to incorporate technology and how that can help them tell a better story on the narratives or how complex some of these discussions are. And for our final question, uh, Destry Jarvis of U.S. Psychomos is asking you both, in either country, is there an official public policy process for the consideration of what to do about controversial monuments? Uh, uh, it's, it's nice. Uh, uh, this is a never ending question. I mean, uh, what to do, uh, <laughs> what to do with the monument or what to do with the controversial monument. And, uh, and it's never stopped uh, here either 30 years after the World War Revolution. So you have still this question. But uh, for example, Conic Monument, uh, as you could see, uh, there, were, there were no discussion. There were nothing. They just decided to remove. So um, what, uh, what I say, the situation now, uh, I think it's, uh, uh, it's worse uh, than, uh, than in 89 or 90. I think the, uh, the society in 89 or 90 were more, uh, have more, had more liberated uh, opinion about uh, what to do about, uh, what to do with the monument, what to do with the controversial monument. Uh, they were everywhere, yeah, and the big places uh, everywhere. Uh, so, uh, and there were many, many discussions. Unfortunately, there were no result uh, of this discussion. Sometimes, yes, they 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 um, resulted to move it uh, to relocate it in the museums. Uh, it's uh, it's a very um, it's it's normal. It's a standard. And uh, but uh, what to do next? And for example, to create a museum um, of the statue. Uh, some. This kind of museum were never created in Czechoslovakia or in Czechoslovak Republic. Uh, if you if you visit Europe, you you can see some kind of this museum of this type of museum in Budapest in Hungary or in uh, where in Lithuania I think also in Sofia in Bulgaria also they have some museum uh, of this type of, where you have this many statues uh, uh, located, situated in the park. So 
it's a never ending question. Yeah, it's a, definitely an interesting question. I think one that we're all seized with. Um, and I think part of it, yes, is about controversial monuments or statues, but um, it could also just speak to heritage more broadly. Um, and I think one of the speakers there too had asked you know, questions about assimilation um, and what that meant um, in Taiwan. Um, so I kind of, I'll address it from that kind of broader heritage, cultural heritage perspective, because um, I would say that cultural heritage does matter to people in Taiwan, but it's a nuanced matter of whose cultural heritage and whose values we're promulgating. Um, for instance, many people are dev devout Buddhists or Taoists and society is of course heavily influenced by Confucian tradition, right? People actually go to temples to pray, they engage in religious rites, and that's like an everyday lived tradition. Um, and I think one really interesting thing we see now is there are also efforts to support indigenous languages and culture and heritage and to empower different minority groups to preserve and maintain their legacy. And that's seen as important too, right? And this contrasts very sharply with um, Taiwan under Chiang Kai-shek and the KMT who actually tried to wipe out other languages like Hakka or Hokkien by forcing everyone to use Mandarin Chinese, right? So today, if we're talking about these issues, um, I think it's really about safeguarding diverse heritages um, as a plural democracy should rather than imposing a narrow Chinese definition of what society should look like. Um, and so when we then bring that back to this idea of statues, I'd say it's not just about the outcome, right, what you do about the statues, but just as important, it's also about this process, learning about the collective past, continuing to bring it to light, processing trauma, inoculating future generations against authoritarianism. So if you socialize ideas and learn about the past from each other, um, I think this slowly works toward a consensus. So even if the extremists won't come to the table, the majority of society may eventually get there. That was perfect. Thank you both for offering your responses. And I hope that at the end of this webinar, you'll all be able to gain a takeaway about how important it is to have uh, complex solutions to complex issues. And with a lot of these, and in both presentations, it's not easy to just have a one size fits all approach. So whether that's the policy or whether it's how the public can get involved with redefining their spaces. So to close out this webinar, I will be reintroducing the director of the Monuments Toolkit, Sakina Moore. Thank you again for joining us for this very insightful conversation. I wanted to thank the Mellon Foundation uh, for their generous support without which our work would not be possible. I also wanted to thank uh, Petra Shwadova and Kevin Fansu for leading uh, these um, very insightful discussions and for William Humphrey for, uh, for moderating. I do encourage everyone to visit www.usicomos.org and to sign up to learn more about the work that we're doing and to learn about the progress of the Monuments Toolkit. Thank you so much again and have a great weekend.